Can you hear me on Zoom? Yes. Perfect. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. One, two. Okay, shall we get started?
Um, all right, so welcome again to, to a new class of uh, CS140. Um, so, uh, I loaded up the wrong slide. We have to finish. <laughs> um, we have to finish from, uh, I'm sorry. Um, it was lecture seven and we stopped here. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, it was here where we left last time. So, um, so if you remember last time we were talking about minimax, the minimax algorithm, how we basically do a min and a max and often in between them we have uh, game these games where we play against an opponent. It's not as a, as a, as we had the, the setting before we had a search. It's, it's not a search uh, anymore, which is just a, towards a goal. We actually have an opponent now. And uh, we were talking about alpha beta pruning, if you remember last time. So, so we, we stopped around here with these ideas of, um, of how do we, we prune the tree to make the computation more efficient. And we can see how sometimes we can get rid of these two, for example, these two nodes, because, because they won't affect the results uh, of our computation. Let me just hide this also. Yeah, so so we can prune um, prune these this tree and um, and and that's piece of the computation. And sometimes we we saw how we can get um, twice as deeper, twice deeper with the same amount of computation. Basically, if we do alpha beta pruning, we can go twice deeper than before. Um, in on average, so so let's see. So um, so now. Um, we're going to talk about a few things to, uh, so in this class, we're going to finish a few things here uh, on the minimax. And, uh, and then we're gonna talk about afterwards about macro decision processes. So, um, so one, um, one problem we, uh, again, we often have, especially when we do real time decisions that we, we can't take too long to make decisions and basically to go too deep in the tree. So what, sometimes uh, people do is that we cut off the search earlier. We replace this, this terminal test function that we used before with a cutoff. So we, we, don't, we, we just stop after a certain point. And, and of course we apply a heuristic function eval in, instead of using the, uh, we, we, before we had terminal nodes, which had final utility. Now we have to evaluate the utility with the, with the a heuristic basically. Um, so, so this is what, what I mean by replacing this with an e, uh, with an eval. Um, and this is the kind of depth you get for some of these games. So for chess, um, for chess, you get something to, uh, 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 you can get a trees of around 10 to the power of 120 nodes, which is, which is huge. So we cannot basically uh, search through, through that, that, that entire tree and, and that depth. Um, so we cut off the search early to make it, uh, to make it work um like this so basically if uh, yeah we would turn it if the instead of a terminal test where we return the uh, so at, at the at the final node we, we used to return the utility now we simply return the evaluation the based on the heuristic of that state um so yes um and, and we basically introduce a fixed depth, basically a depth limit, a depth of a 50 or 100. We don't go infinitely deep in the tree. Um, when a cutoff occurs, we simply uh, evaluate and then we backtrack up in the tree. Um, so um, so this, this basically means that we need to use an evaluation function. Um, and what we were doing before with graphs, if you remember, we were doing heuristics, right? We were kind of trying to estimate how close are we to the goal state. Now we're kind of doing something similar. We, we're just trying to estimate how, um, how good that state is, the goodness of the state. That's what I mean by goodness. So um, um, we, we'll see a few examples in a bit. So um, basically that's the idea. So this is kind of like very similar to the heuristic search we were doing uh, before uh, in, in graphs. Um, uh, the, the, there's a few differences. So that, that heuristic search in graphs was always non-negative. Here, the, these these goodness costs can be negative. Um, yeah, so uh, for example, we can even have like a zero sum assumption where we basically say, for for example, like if if in chess, uh, for example, we can say that if f of n 
is greater than zero, is, uh, that means that the position N is good for me and bad for you. Vice versa, if it's uh, negative, it means that it's bad for me and good for you. Um, if it's zero, it's kind of neutral. It's, it's a neutral move, uh, neutral state. Uh, and uh, and of course, if it's infinity plus infinity, it could be a win for me and uh, and I was a win for you. So for that, that that's a kind of utility. Uh, no, let's say evaluation function here uh, that we can use. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk. We use the term utility function very shortly in, uh, when we talk about Markov decision processes. Um, does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. I see some confused looks here. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so, yeah, so uh, a few examples. So for tic-tac-toe, for example, we can count, for example, a tic-tac-toe, we have to do the crosses and the, and the, and the circles. Um, the evaluation function could be, for example, we can count how many three lengths are open for me and subtract that how many three lengths are open for you, basically. And we can kind of like see if, if I, if I have a lot of openings on my side, then, then it means it's a, you know, it's a good state for me. If I'm kind of blocked in all directions, uh, it means it's bad. It's bad in my case, for example. And this is, this is still like, remember, this is not a terminal state. This is still like halfway through the game. You want to you have a state and you're trying to evaluate how good uh, the state is for you versus for the opponent. So, so we're talking about any states, even halfway in the game. Um, for example, for chess, um, Alan Turing, uh, famously proposed um, an evaluation of function for chess where you basically count, uh, you, you, take, you take the fraction of WN over BN, and basically WN is the sum of point values of white pieces, BN is the sum of the blacks, so we count uh, all the pieces for the white, uh, divide by all the pieces for the, for the blacks. So there's, there's a, sorry, the number of points corresponding to the pieces. So a pawn is one, one point, a horse three points, uh, and so on. So you can count them up. Um, um, of course, it's it's a simplification. This is a simplification. You you've played chess. I, I guess most of most of you have played chess. You know how sometimes it's important not just the value of the pieces, but where they are on the board. Like a horse is much better positioned if it's somewhere in the center of the of the board than if it's like stuck in a corner, for example. Uh, same for other pieces. So. So it, it, there is much more going on, but this is still a simplification of you know how how we can basically, um, uh, yeah, tell roughly the goodness of the state. Sometimes we want to do more. Sometimes we also want to specify the evaluation function as a sum over features, as a as a weighted sum in particular. We take multiple features and we weight them up in a particular way. So that, that's that's another way in which, um, for example, it could be oh the for example, we can have a weight for each piece in, in chess, for example. We can have a one a one a single weight for each piece and so on. Um, we can get very creative with these things. Um, yeah, piece placement, squares controlled, and so on. So uh, so for example, the the famous deep blue uh, computer that beat Gary Kasparov in chess in 97 used around 6,000 features like this to to uh yeah to do the search and basically and then the, sorry and the evaluation of the states six thousand features yeah H how would you come up with six thousand features any idea You can think of how you can maybe do it even automatically. You don't, for example, you don't have to always hand handcraft them. You can do all kinds of like even automatic um, feature detection methods that exist. This, 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 uh, sometimes you don't have to like hand hand handcraft all these kinds of features. So uh, that's just another idea to kind of have in mind that they can be automatically inferred. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, there's a few more issues we have. We have the choice of the horizon, how, um, again, how deep we look, how, how deep we search in the tree, how many moves ahead do we look. Uh, for example, I was, I was rewatching briefly the documentary for AlphaGo, uh, actually today, and, uh, and it was, uh, have, how many of you have heard of AlphaGo? Some, oh, I see. So, so AlphaGo was, um, was an AI 
algorithm that, that was uh, created by DeepMind, which is an AI company based in London. And they beat, uh, they beat the world champion in, at Go uh, in 2016. And Go, Go, G-O, is basically one of these like very complicated board games, much more complex than chess, where at, at each, basically um, um, it has a much larger branching factor. In chess, you have like 35 moves you can make at each step in Go, you can have like hundreds, hundreds. So it's, um, I think, much a uh, higher order of magnitude in terms of like complexity. So, um, and it has many more pieces. It's, uh, yeah, it's a much more complex game. So anyway, uh, uh, the AI method was able to beat um, the world champion um, just in 2016. So that, that was just achieved five years, seven years ago. Um, and, uh, the, the why I'm saying that is because the, the horizon they had was around 60 moves ahead. They were looking. So they were looking generally like 60 moves ahead, which, which was, uh, and with a, with a branching factor of like in the order of hundred, that's a lot. So with a hundred to the power of 60, you can look at, think of the complexity um, uh, of the tree that they were searching through. So huge. Um, and anyway, um, so we, and when we talk about, again, about these, uh, as I said, like 100 to the power of 60, then you're talking about like huge memory. They have to store all of those uh, states in memory somehow, which is a lot of numbers. Um, again, number of nodes examined, all this stuff. So, so it, gets, it gets very complicated. Um, th therefore, sometimes what people do in practice is that they do a, a kind of adaptive search. Um, this means um, several things. For example, we, we can not necessarily have a fixed depth in which we look at. For example, we can have a, va a variable like depth level. Sometimes we, we look 50 steps ahead. Sometimes we look 60 steps ahead, depending on the moves. That, that's what we mean by, by adaptive search. Um, uh, we, we can wait for quiescence. Sometimes there's hot spots in particular, in particular times of the game or like in particular, like, let, let's say nodes. Uh, at some point, for example, there's like a battle somewhere in chess, like, you know, there's like, uh, like a rapid takeover of different pieces. So in those, for example, in those, after we explore those, uh, well, in those nodes and areas, we can explore deeper, for example, to, to understand what would be the end result of those. And whereas in, in for other moves, which are less, more boring, maybe we can uh, search uh, through less. Uh, and, um, Yes, this is, this is called the horizon effect where we're endlessly delaying a bad move, uh, which, which might, might be inevitable. We might have to make anyway uh, later on so that that can also happen. Uh, we extend uh, singular nodes and a secondary search. So, um, so we can cache moves that are clearly better than others. We can use, uh, again, caching techniques to, uh, to store certain, certain moves and pieces uh, and then reuse them later on. Um, Yes, so, um, so there's another important uh, element we haven't covered, which is chance. What happens for games that involve chance? Like, let's say backgammon. Um, we have to roll some uh, two dice to, uh, to make it, and then make a move. Uh, so far, for all these, all these games we spoke to for chess and so on, there's no chance involved. We always, you know, if we move... A piece somewhere else, it, it definitely moves there. But here, there's chance involved. So, so in that case, our tree becomes. We have a max here. We have a max node. We have a min. We have min nodes. We have a max let's say, level and min level and so on. And then we have these chance nodes now that we introduce. And basically, that means from here we make a move. And then there's there's an element of chance. Then we roll some uh, the dice, for example, and and depending on the outcome, for example, we can end up here. And and that's where the, and that's when the player main makes a move. So so we so we add an extra extra layers of complexity in our tree that we have to model. So um, there's many more moves that are possible now. Even even though you um, even though Max makes a move, then you can, you can uh, sorry so so. For example, white, white, can, you can roll like a six, five, and then you can have possible moves. These are all possible moves that you can make after you roll a six, five die. So there's many, many types of moves. Um, and they all have even different chances. For example, to roll a one, one, you have a double the chance of rolling a one, two, for example. Um, 
So, um, yeah, um, so a, a half the chance, I meant to say, a one one would have half the chance of loading uh, the other ones. So one, 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 two, and so on. So we have to take into account. So, so then, um, what brings here is the fact that we cannot actually directly apply min max anymore here in these cases. In this case, when we have gates based on chance, we have to do something different. Um, we have to do what is called, we have to take the expected value of, uh, over, over the probabilities. How many of you have seen expected values before? So, but not everybody, not everybody. So, okay, so um, we'll, 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 do a quick, uh, we'll do a quick recap of that, a very short one. But, but in general, I, I'll, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping you'll sort of like read a bit at home about expected values. Um, expected value is basically an average. We take an average over, the, over all these uh, potential outcomes of the die, of all these chances, basically. We take, we take an average over all of those, uh, more precisely a weighted average. And, that, and that's, that's what we mean by expected value. Um, and then we compute the utility as the expected av uh, weighted average over those uh, uh, chance outcomes. Um, so this is what we call expecting max because now instead of doing minimax, now we did expected value over the outcomes, over the, the probabilistic outcomes. So we, do, we call this expecting max. Um, so, so the, the, and, and the chances again, the chances in all these games in solitaire, for example, we don't know when the next card, uh, what the next card will be. In Minesweeper, we don't know the mine locations. Um, in Pac-Man, the ghost can act randomly. Uh, so, which, which is your own assignment. So, uh, so we have to take, um, we have to take the um, expected value uh, over these. Um, so, Yes, and we'll formalize this later on uh, using what we call Markov decision processes in a bit. Actually, I hope we'll cover through a good chunk of it in, later on in today's class. Um, yeah, so, but, but let, let, let's do this example. So we have a max node, we have two chance nodes, and then we have the final terminal states here, which have utilities. So let's, let's say this one has a, a probability 0 0.5 to be reached, this one has 0 0.5. Then we compute the, the weighted average of, of, of this outcome of this node. So this node here would be the weighted average 10 times 0 0.5 plus four times 0 0.5, which is seven. And that will be the, the uh, expected value at this node, which is the weighted average according to the probabilities. And the same thing here, for example, if we have like this, this, this node five has a 0 0.75 chance, this one has 0 0.25 the weighted average is 4.6. So it's five times the 0 0.75 plus seven times 0 0.25. That's how we got it. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it clear? Yeah. Um, so, so why why do we minimize? What well, no, what what should I know? Why do we take the suspected average instead of instead of minimization or instead of doing the uh, standard minimax? Um, there is this uh, this principle of maximum expected utility. Basically, we, it means that if the agent is rational, it will try to maximize the expected utility. And expected utility is what we saw earlier, how we do the averaging over over the nodes. So. Um, so this is a general principle for, yeah, in general for agents. Um, it might not always be the best choice, but it's a good principle. It's, it's one of good, it's, it's a good rule of thumb to follow. So, um, and this is what we often mean by rationality. We mean, again, uh, we were defining this a bit earlier in, in, the, in the first few lectures, a rational agent was trying to maximize its, its utility, especially its, its future utility. We'll see, we'll see shortly what we mean by that and how. Um, so it's trying to maximize the utility, and in this case, since it's a probabilistic, it's trying to maximize the expected utility. Um, let's do a quick reminder. So, since some of you have not seen uh, expected values before, so so what do we mean by this? So, so this is a, a reminder of probabilities and statistics. Um, a random value represents an event whose outcome is unknown. So this this is what we often and I'll use the board for some of these. 
Um, so we often denote them with capital letters, like X, capital X would be a random variable. Um, small x would be generally like a value that capital X can take. So this is generally the notation that is used. So um, so that, that's a random variable. It can take, um, it's, it, it basically can, it can take many outcomes. So for example, for this one, um, random variable T is whether you, uh, there's traffic on the street. Uh, it can have uh, three outcomes, none, uh, no traffic, light traffic or heavy traffic. Uh, and also has an associated distribution of, over these values. And this is a problem, what you call the probability distribution, which is an assignment of weight, these outcomes. So basically for each of these outcomes, for none, for light and for heavy, we assign these weights. So for so probability that, uh, that the traffic, uh, there's no traffic is 0.25, the, the probability that there's light traffic is 0.55, probability that there's heavy traffic is 0.20. So, um, and there's a, there's a few law, important laws of probabilities. Uh, all of them have to be positive. All these numbers have to be positive, uh, zero or, or between between zero and one, in more, more precisely. And um, and they always have to sum to one, so that the sum of all of them has to be one. Yeah, and and these are the probabilities over what we call discrete events. We won't go into, into advanced statistics, but we can have probabilities of continuous events. Uh, those will be um, probability density functions and so on. This will be, a, this is what we define a probability mass function because it's for discrete variables. Um, so, um, and of course, as, as we get, and we see it later on when we study Bayesian statistics in this course, we'll see how these probabilities can change later on. Maybe initially there's this, the probability of having traffic is a 20, 0, 20, 20%. But later, later on, if we, if we condition on a particular hour, so if we say, oh, now if we know some extra information that uh, the probability of traffic at 8 a.m., this can change the probability. So now uh, probability of having heavy traffic, given that uh, we're looking, the hour is 8 a.m., is higher, it's 60%. So it, it's, uh, it's uh, this is called the conditional probability. Pro uh, this probability of P equals heavy conditioned on that the hour is eight. So, um, so we'll, um, I'm not gonna go into, again, into too much details on this, but if you have any trouble with this, yeah, with these, uh, do come to the office hours and then ask, and I'll we'll, uh, happy to clarify any of the, any questions on probability statistics, yeah. Um, Expectations, again, another thing I'm, oh, yeah, there's a question here, yeah. The value that that uh, that capital X can take. So, so for example, um, um, if I say probability of big X equals heavy, what we saw earlier, yeah, so uh, so that, that that's basically what 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 this means. So for example, this uh, probability that x is heavy, so we're in instead of t. So, um, but for example, we can say let, let's let's do a different setting. So for example, x can be in the set of zero, one, and two. So probability that x equals zero is zero point two. P that x equals one is zero point. Five p and that, and this is capital X. Capital X equals two equals zero point in the rest zero point three. So now what I mean to say is, um, if I write, you'll see shortly, like, like actually in, in that formula, which is here, if I now write sum over small x in zero one two of P of capital X equals small x, this will be, be what? Can you all see here? Yeah. 
So x, this is this is small x in zero, one, and two. So that, that means it's we replace each of these variables here in a small x. So p that capital X equals zero plus p that cap p of capital X equals one, and so on. So this is what this means. P of capital X equals zero plus p of capital X equals one plus p of capital X equals two is equal to the sum of those, which is one. So uh, I was showing it mostly so that you understand some the notation because this is what, uh, what is used. So, so this is uh, small x would be used to denote the actual variable that the actual, the, the values, not the values that the, that the random variable can take. Yeah. Um, we'll see. We'll see today in this in this lecture in a few slides. You'll see this being used in in, in the Markov property. Um, so do uh, that's why I'll leave it on the board. Uh, we, we will use that notation. So uh, so this is um, yeah the the same thing here. Um, so ex exactly the same thing actually. So you see how this. Small t versus capital T. Small t refers to the values that capital T can take. So, so here, what, 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 what this, uh, what, what, what I'm showing this slide is the is the is the definition of expectation, the expected value of a random variable, which has a, this formula. So basically, the expected value represents it the average over it's it's a weighted average over all the possible values that a random variable can take with the with the corresponding uh, Wait. So, so again, if we have the, um, this example, how long do we to get to the airport? Uh, we have a little random variable. The length of driving time as a function of traffic. So, if um, if if there's no traffic, we have twenty kilometers that or twenty miles that we're uh, traveling. Light traffic thirty, heavy traffic sixty. No, sorry, sixty minutes. This is not a mile. Uh, sixty minutes, thirty minutes, twenty minutes. So what is my expected driving time? It's basically the sum over uh, of, of these, of the length of time that it takes times the probability, how, how likely this is, these are. So, so remember that the, the probabilities were 0 0.25, 0 0.50, and 0 0.25 again. So if we do the expected value, we basically get you know, 0 0.25 times 20 plus 0 0.5 for light traffic times 30. Plus 0 25 uh, for heavy traffic times 60. So that's how we get an average duration of 35 minutes. It takes us to to travel to the airport. Yeah. Um, so if this is clear, um, so um, so we're basically uh, so going back to the expected max search. This is exactly what we're using. We're using um, we could be in the expected value over over the states that are probabilistic states. So, so here in our case, again, the, uh, the, again, these upward triangles are the max nodes, where we may where we take a move in Pac-Man. These nodes are chance nodes. For example, they are taken by the ghost. So um, we have to compute expected values over over these because each of these uh, will have some weight associated with them. And we need to have a, a model over the over these. Probabilities. Basically, we have to need to have a model over how how likely it is for this ghost to make a move, make a particular move. For example, is it how likely is it to move to the left or to the right, and so on? Uh, like a probabilistic model to define like are they, are they is it equally likely to move in these in all these directions, or do we have certain biases? Um, and if we have a model of of any sort, then we can basically compute the expected max algorithm. The, the model can be even uniform. We can even have uniform equal probabilities of doing all these actions for the ghosts. Um, so how do we do in pseudocode? So so expected max. So so we define uh, a function of value given a particular node s. Um, if s is a max node, then we return the, uh, a function max value of s. If x is an expectation node over chance, uh, you know, over, over chance outcomes, then we do we do an expected value of s. 
if this is a terminal no, we will simply return the evaluation over S. Um, this is evaluation because it could be like it could be capped weight so uh, capped depth. Sorry, so uh, so it means that we have to use the heuristic or the evaluation function. Um, so so max values here is basically taking going through all the successes and taking the maximum. Uh, expected value is almost the same thing going over the successes, getting the probabilities for the successes, and then taking the expectation of those values of the weights. So we take the the weight is sum of, of the values according to the weights. Am I going too fast or too slow? Too fast? Too slow? Nobody? How, how, yeah, I, I feel, yes, yeah, maybe, maybe it's a bit late and some of, yeah, I, I know, I know it's, I know it's, it's very late. So kind of some of you are a bit sleepy. Um, We'll do we'll do a few a few exercises short uh, shortly and uh, and we'll make it a bit more yeah more engaging yeah question yes yes um actually oh, one second actually I hope I'm not wrong I think so um. Actually, let me think on that. Uh, let me let me think. Uh, I'll I'll get back to you uh, next time. Let me think on it. Actually, I'm not sure. Huh? Yes. Would you, would you have a chance of losing the optimization? You've not traded for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think yeah. Actually, I think it's not it's not obvious. Yeah. Uh, if you can use it. Yeah, this is a max. Yes, yes, you're right. You're right. No, yeah, you cannot use it. I don't think so, actually. Yeah, because he they expected the values. Mate, but hmm, hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I don't know, but there might be something, there might be some kind of pruning you might still be able to do. Actually, I'm not sure. I don't know with the extra if you can do some kind of pruning, maybe not alpha beta, but something else, one of similar. Hmm. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, the one thing is to, to, to want to say here is that notice how that we, we've sort of like gotten away from um, um, Thinking that's like uh, well, if these um, ghosts or these like agents are actually like you know kind of like an opponent, we can we can also think of them as basically being part of the environment. So basically, these uh, these ghosts or these kind of like other agents, we can also think of them as being part of the environment because we can have like even several opponents, and then we we can sort of like think of them in the in the exact same framework, but. Uh, we can still have an opponent or even multiple opponents. Our aim is still to maximize our rewards, our utility, reg regardless if you have one opponent or two or more, or, or if they're all just part of the environment and the environment just changes. Um, so we can also think of it like that. We don't even need to have necessarily an explicit opponent uh, in mind. Um, so, um, so yes, the Pac-Man has a belief distribution over how they will act. We, we, um, yeah, yeah, it, it depends, and, and you, it depends on your algorithms how you implement them. But we can do all kinds of interesting things. We can make assumptions about those ghosts. Um, I, I, maybe some of you have already done some of this, like uh, and how exactly where exactly they're going to move, and uh, or or if not, we'll 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 see in in the subsequent uh, pro uh, problem, you know, project uh, project two and three. Um, so and then another really interesting. Um, observation I wanted to make is that if you take this further, for example, you, you can basically end up computing uh, because you, you take into account your opponent's belief system, though, though these distributions of the outcomes, uh, but you can, uh, you can end up going a step further and taking the distribution of outcomes or depending on your uh, decisions and so on. So you can go deeper and deeper like this. Um, and it can it can basically get out of hand very quickly, basically if you if you take it at multiple multiple levels. Um, 
we sort of saw this in Minimax as well, like kind of how you th you take you make a decision based on the best decision of your opponent, which was based on your decision, and so on and back and forth. So, um, yeah, and I think in in the in the economics literature, this is called like levels of rationality. Like, how many levels of rationality do you do you compute and calculate depending on your on on your on your opponent? So, yeah. So this these are this is another like terminology of how this is called uh, in the game theory in economics. Um, yeah, so um, so again, so we have uh, um, actually, let me see, I might. Yeah, so 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 we, we, we said all of this already, but what, what I wanted to highlight here is that we have these utilities for, again, for terminal states, we have utilities. Um, and and of course, we, if, if, if we want to not go all the way to the end, if we, do, if we want to cap at a particular depth, we can do static evaluations. So, um, so this is, for example, th th these are the true utilities at, at the very end. We, we might not be able to get all the way to the end to, to these nodes, so we kind of stop somewhere there. And, and those are kind of like the, the, uh, the expected values that we compute over, over the evaluation functions. Um, so, this, um, so this is kind of, I'll skip, I'll just show, these are a few examples of games that were used sort of like, you know, in, in AI uh, methods and like some little history about how, yeah, uh, uh, this, so this, this is basically like Marion Tinsley, who was a, a professional checkers champion, and he only lost seven games in his lifetime. Uh, and this was a robot called Chinook that that was that was able to to beat him twice, only twice, uh, in a few games. Uh, I forgot when, but uh, yeah, uh, which year exactly? So I think it was in the nineties, early nineties. In backgammon, we've we've had some uh, some AI models like this that were able to uh, to do well against world championships, and and this is one example of a game that actually has changed the way humans play backgammon. So the, so the AIs have changed have have taught us a lot of how to play it, and actually it has, we humans have changed our way uh, to, to play it. So uh, well, I mean experts at least. Um, I'll skip over some of this. This was a very interesting story. Um, it was in the 60s and, uh, and, and it was at MIT, this uh, professor Hubert Dreyfus um, was, wrote, wrote this critique of AI and it was this book. And one of the things he was saying was that uh, computers are not smart. They cannot do very complex things, for example, and tasks like, for example, they, they can play checkers, but they cannot uh, play chess, play a game of chess, for example. And, um, and so basically, the, the, uh, the this was uh, what he wrote. Then, like um, the one, one of the, I think Herbert Simon, who was uh, a professor also at MIT, um, organized actually to uh, for him to for for Hubert Dreyfus to play a game of chess against an AI, and actually Hubert lost. So, so this so the same guy who said like the oh the computers cannot play chess. So well, he lost against the AI against the computer. And then the MIT AI lab wrote a, a, a memo who said that neither can Hubert Dreyfus. So, <laughs> so that was a that was an interesting, funny story. Um, so kind of it, it shows a bit how, well, at least with AI, how people sometimes uh, underestimate uh, sometimes the the capabilities of the AI, but sometimes also overestimate and inflate. There were also many predictions who said that oh by Back in the '60s, they were said, "Oh, by by early 2000s, we'll have completely crazy AI systems. Like they will be superhuman, and they will be able to do all these tasks." And it hasn't happened actually. So, um, if you remember, if you if any of you have watched the 2001 Space Odyssey, um, the, the movie, um, the well, the it was written. Uh, it was it was made in the '60s, and the reason it was made it was 2001 was because they, they, that's what people believed. Uh, would be a technology we would have by 2001, uh, which wasn't wasn't the case. We didn't have those kind those kinds of that hot uh, computer, for example, by 2001 that was able to communicate with humans. So anyway, um, um, yeah. So let's let's move to the next. Um, 
next lecture. Yeah. Um, actually, how about this? How about I give you a quick five minute break now since we're starting a new one and because I haven't done a, and then we can we can resume in five minutes, especially since it's late here. Yeah. Um, I question. I Tony cares about the domain, not the code. It only cares about the axis. You know, in calculus, it goes from an x to a y. It only cares about the, the domain. The x doesn't care about the y. That's why. Even if the even the, the constraints are there. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, 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 nice. it's not possible in general. Yes, but that's that's not what our consistency. Uh, that, like, that's exactly that's the whole thing. Like the yeah, because that, that that's that's a constraint of the code domain, not the, the original domain. Oh, okay. You know how function has a domain and call domain. Yeah. F goes from X to Y. Yeah. X to the domain. So, so the accuracy is a constraint on the domain. Okay. So basically, basically that's what you see. You know, you, like you don't care about the your call domain. You can have something that doesn't care that you shouldn't have in the call domain, but it doesn't care about the gotcha. okay. it. Because for all the X's in the domain, there has to be a Y in the call domain. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so okay, that's it. Okay, that's yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's still post on the pizza, though. Or you, can, you can still post it actually as a. Of course, post, post on Piazza and like, uh, I can, I'll, I'll ask it. Or you should give me this. Yeah, of course. Okay, shall we continue? We'll have we'll have a. I hope we'll have time to do a quiz later on. So we're, so we're, we're trying to make it a bit more, yeah, a bit more upbeat. So I know it's late, and some of you I know, I've been more sleepy. So um, let's let let's okay. So let's start talking about the next lecture, which is markup decision processes and reinforcement learning, which are really interesting topics. Really interesting topics. Um, so. 
so let's start. So, um, so basically, we uh, we have to introduce this concept of a maximum expected utility, um, which um, well, we kind of introduced it like with expected utility just just now before the break, um, and we spoke about the principle of maximum expected utility that a rational agent should choose to maximize expected utility. We've already discussed about this. Um, we have to cover a few more things about like, you know, where, these, where do these utilities come from? And, uh, you know, what do they mean? Um, how do we know they exist? How do we work with them mathematically? What are their properties, the exact like mathematical properties under, underlying these utility functions? Um, what, is the, what is the resulting behavior of applying one utility function versus the other? All these, all these are questions we have to cover. So, um, so let's see. So, so utilities are basically functions of of the outcomes of certain events that describe sort of like you know preferences, describe like how or or some kind of values, like how um, how much you value a particular outcome. Um, like if I, if 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 you give me two fruits, like a an apple and and a pear, I can assign some kind of values to each one and say, oh, I like the apple more than the pear, so then I give it a high utility, right? Does it make sense? So it's it's an abstract concept. It really depends on on each agent in part. Maybe somebody else prefers the pear, not the apple, and so on. Um, and and it basically it comes up a lot in the uh, in economics, for example. Again, it's there's examples like the utility of money, for example. It's like how um, how often is it's not linear. For example, like. Um, one dollar maybe has like one point of utility, maybe a thousand dollars has a thousand points of utility, let's say, but once you go maybe like a million or a billion or a trillion, maybe ten billion is the same as one billion for you because it's almost the same it's it's such a huge amount of money that you don't know what to do with it anymore. So maybe one billion is worth also ten billion as not much as ten billion for a normal person. So um so that's why maybe the utility is not exactly linear. It could be sort of like slowly slowly plateauing uh, after a while. So that, that could be a, a side that the utility might be nonlinear, for example, in the case of money. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, so, um, and, and, and there's, there's other kind of concepts, like for example, the, uh, uh, there's something called like time, time discounting, we'll cover very shortly, like $1 today is worth, uh, has a higher utility than $1 in a year. Because 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 of many things, you can do more with one dollar today than you can do within a year. You have access to it sooner; it has a higher utility. So this is what we mean. Uh, so they can be very simple, like uh, these plus ones or minus ones. They can we summarize they summarize our goals. Um, and and there's a theorem that says that any rational preferences can be summarized as a utility function. So for any of these rational preferences, we can we can have a utility function to summarize them. Um, we we hardwire the utilities, we fix them, and then we let the behaviors emerge. For a particular utility function, your Pac-Man agent might do some, might do a particular path. For a different utility function, you might choose a different path instead. So, uh, and that that's what we mean by behaviors that emerge. Um, why don't we let the agents pick utilities? Why don't we prescribe behaviors? Well, uh, it's yes, yeah, a bit more complicated if we don't have if we let the agents pick utilities. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we won't cover that in in our in this course, but it's a very interesting research area. Um, um, so to give a, to give an example, so imagine um, actually let me go here. So so imagine you're in a ice cream shop and you you're trying to buy an ice cream. So for example, let's say there's there's three outcomes. You either get just an empty cone or you get one scoop of an ice cream or you get two scoops. I mean, maybe some of you don't like ice cream at all. So then maybe, you know, you, just, you just only just want the, the cone, maybe you do something else. So, so some of you might prefer this. Maybe some, some of you love ice cream, so you prefer the, the two, two scoops. Maybe, yeah, I don't know, maybe some, some people are on a diet, for example, and they want, so they, they would value this one more than, than the others. So all of these are potential, um, yeah, so people would generally give different uh, utilities to, to these outcomes. But let's say now we make it a bit more interesting. So there's also a probabilistic uh, sort of element to it. Like, for example, if um, you can either get a single or you can get a, or you can get a double. So, um, so you can go to the shop, you ask for a single scoop or a double scoop. 
But what happens is that if you get a double scoop, sometimes it can fall off, basically. And, and, and it would, with a certain probability, let's say 10%, uh, we can actually, the, the ice cream can fall off a little bit, and basically you end up with just a cone. Um, but most likely you'll get the full two scoops. And if you get a single scoop, it never falls off. Like you only get a single one. So, so we can start again uh, assigning um, utilities to each of these events. This, this has utility 10, this has utility 100, this has 50. And then we have probabilities for each of these events. The, the, the probability of your, of your scoops falling off, uh, if you get a double is 20%. Uh, but here it, you, you know, it never falls off. You always you always get it in full. Um, if you get a single scoop, so 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 what I'm trying to say is the, the, we can compute the expected utility for getting a single scoop, which is this probability of being getting a single scoop, which is one times fifty. So that's that's the utility of fifty that for the, for this node, and for this other node, for getting a double is p of n times that's u, u of empty. So the probability of being empty twenty percent times ten plus eighty percent times a hundred, which comes out as eighty two. Question, yeah. Um, it's the same, but basically um, these, uh, these values, these utility values, you can compute them with heuristics, but afterwards when you have probabilistic outcomes, you just take the expected values over, over. So you, you, you weight the heuristic uh, evaluations uh, with those probabilities. You can combine them, so yeah. Yeah, that's it. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so, so notice again how we now take, we, we, and we've seen another example before, but now, now this is a, a um, we, we're going to another example because, because we, we are now we're going to cover something a bit more abstract. That's why we went to this example. So, um, we're going to talk about preferences. So, so basically, imagine you have, um, a binary event like this. So don't look at the text for now. Like imagine you're here and, and with one probability P, you can basically get to A with the probability one minus P, you get to event B. And basically, uh, so this is, this is like, um, there's two different outcomes for, uh, from this particular state. And, and basically, so, um, and you have to choose uh, among, among, among different options. So, um, so for example, with a, a lottery has, uh, again, like it's, it's, it's an event with two outcomes. You can either win the lottery or, or not win the lottery or lose the lottery. So, so you can win with a very low probability, otherwise not win with a very high probability. Um, and what we say, again, we have some notions of preferences. We, we use that, uh, this sign that A is preferred over B. This is what it means. This, this, this uh, symbol means A is indifferent uh, with B. So basically we have no preference between A or either between A or B. And this one means that uh, B is not preferred over A. It's kind of like an equivalent of like greater than or equal to. So basically it means it could also be, we could also be indifferent between A and B, but, uh, but we could also prefer A over B. So we have these symbols um, and we can start talking about uh, rational preferences. So, um, so for example, we, um, this is um, a rational preference that would be a preference that, that obeys a transitivity rule. So, so this is a transitivity rule. So if A is preferred over B and B is preferred over C, then by, by transitivity, we get that A is preferred over C, option A over option C. And this is, again, these are not numbers anymore. These are options, like actions you can take as an agent. Um, and, and again, and, uh, and, 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 and if this is obeyed, then basically we can call them that this is, this is um, um, a rational utility uh, that obeys a, trans, a trans, um, transiency property. Um, if, if they are, uh, sorry, if, if they're not transitive, if they're intransitive, then uh, what can happen is that we can basically get in a loop where basically we keep like A is preferred over C, but C is preferred over B, and B is preferred over A. We can keep getting in a loop. and uh, and then basically the, the math doesn't work out anymore. So basically, because you can keep uh, um, losing money or getting discounted uh, an infinite number of times. So, the, so the, 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 math, the mathematics basically breaks off like if you have loops like this. Um, so, um, and, and there's, there's some more um, 
properties that are important to mention about uh, preferences and um, and utilities. And with, so, so for example, one of them is orderability. So um, so either there are either there's either of three outcomes: either A is preferred over B, or B is preferred over A, or we are indifferent between them. It can be either one of these three cases. Um, we have another property called transitivity. Again, what we, we saw in the previous slide. So A, if A is preferred over B and B is preferred over C, then A is preferred over C. We have continuity, which means that um, if A is preferred over B and B is preferred over C, then it means that there exists uh, a probability value P such that this whole event where we basically take A with probability P and C with probability one minus P has to be kind of indifferent to B. If that makes sense. So basically, it means that there's, there's a point in between. Uh, more graphically, if we are, if if A is here and this is C, uh, and B is somewhere here, uh, and these are some kind of like, I don't know, like contours of of like preferences and utilities, then there must be some. Some kind of this is a straight line. There must be some kind of value p here, where we basically take a weighted average between a and p. So this is p a plus one minus p c basically almost. It's not a plus, but it's kind of like that, and which is kind of indifferent to b basically to to event b. So that's continuity. Um, We can also have substitutability where, which basically says that A is uh, indifferent from B um, if this event um, where, where we, with the probability we take A and with the one minus P we take C, we can substitute A for B here. So then we'll, instead of A in this equation, now we have B with, the prob with some probability P we take B and with the rest we take C. If we can substitute one, if, if we're indifferent between events, we can substitute one for the other. And finally, we also have monotonicity, which means that if A is preferred over B, then for any um, probability P that is higher than Q, then this event, PA one minus PB is preferred over QA one minus QB, simply because P is higher than Q. And this basically means that they're monotonic. Um, so you can think of it as a, as a function. This is a function F of, um, yeah. Um, F of AB. Um, sorry, I let me see how to best explain it. Um, yeah, yeah. So basically, this is uh, uh, F of P and F of Q, basically. So if P is greater than Q, F of P is greater than or equal to F of Q. That's more of the basically. Think of it roughly like that. Um, any questions on the, on on all of these so far? Yeah, we'll see, we'll, see, um, we'll see very shortly because we have to define utilities very soon. Um, so, um, so based on based on these, we'll define utilities over these preferences. Pre preferences. Th th these are these are events. These are like you think of them like actions. Do I do I explore node A or node B in the graph? Do I go in Pac-Man? Do you go left or right? These are for, for a single agent. It's it's which which one which preference they prefer. In, like in Pac-Man, do you go north or do you go west, for example? This is these are the three events, for example. And um, give me a give me a few minutes. Yeah, I think I hope it will become more clear. Um, so so basically, from these events, we can. Um, assign utilities to them. So basically you see now how we have A's and B's and now we, we start operating with utility over event A basically. So this is, uh, if A is preferred over B, then the utility of A is higher than the utility of B. So the, so the events are basically, this is like if, if I want to have a, um, $1 or $2, for example, then basically these this, this are like, you know, so I prefer to have two dollars versus one dollar. That's because the utility of two dollars is higher than the utility of one single dollar. 
Yeah. Um, um, it's a formalism. It's, it's basically a formalism of how, uh, yeah, because utilities have to be defined over actions. They don't be defined, cannot be defined over nothing like that. So, yeah. Um, and basically, but, um, um, and, and, and then if we have the utility of a, of a composed event with that with probability P1, we take S1, P, P2, S2, S1, P, and SN, then this is a sum over all individual utilities. This is the uh, additive, uh, additive property, basically, of, so, so basically, yeah. Um, so let's do an exercise. So there, there's um, this, this like uh, paradox of Valet that um, let's actually do it. So, okay. Um, right, so take off your phones and we'll do, we'll do this exercise as a quiz actually. So also, also those of you on Zoom, you can uh, please also do, do it as well because you can do it. Um, so we'll do the following. Yeah, so, so to join join here, so go on your phones, go to joinmyquiz.com and enter this code. And I'll wait for, for you to, to join. Okay, um, I think there's more of you, so. Yeah, is everyone, uh, has everyone joined? This, this, somebody hasn't joined? Yeah, okay. I see, I see a few more still coming. Okay, uh, is everyone in? Okay, a few more, I'm still joining, 43. Okay, so let, let, let's start. So, um, oh, three, two, one, so. So basically you have, uh, this is called the Alley paradox. So which of these utilities do you prefer? Um, and there should be an D one also. I hope you see it. So you have uh, either an A and B and a C and D. So you have two or four options. So you have to choose either one of those options. So, so do you prefer to have four thousand dollars with that probability? Or yeah, or and can I ask some more time? Oh. Is the question clear? So you have to choose either either one of those uh, four. So, so I, uh, between A and B or and, uh, and C and D. Oh. Okay, let, let, let's take 10 more seconds to get answers. Five, four. Okay. Uh, let's end. 
so what do we get? Um, participants view. So quite quite a broad distribution. So um, so we got we got quite a few distributions. So so what what is going on here? Why why do we get so many different opinions on this? So um, yeah, anyone wants to volunteer? Why why, why did you choose A and C? Uh, So can somebody can somebody volunteer? Why did you get choose A and C? Yeah, as a high expected value. Yeah, yeah. So, um, is it is it um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, is that higher than this? Is A high, expected value of A higher than B? Um, Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, so so it has high expected value. Yeah, so, but what? Um, yeah, what about A and D? Somebody who chose a D instead of a C. Like, what about that option? Why did you choose a D? Yeah, I meant choose A and C. I meant choose A and C. Okay, okay. <laughs> I think it's something quite interesting and paradoxical like uh, about this because um, generally, so I think I don't have the answers, but I think most people choose, prefer uh, B and D if I'm not mistaken. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think, I think uh, that that's um, the common, but, but it doesn't, yeah, uh, yeah. It's just B and D, yeah, yeah, why? It's a guarantee, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. You prefer to lose one thousand than to yeah than to risk uh, risk losing. Yeah, yeah. So you see, it, it's also about risk profiles. Sometimes with these utilities and events, sometimes depending on your risk profile, if you wouldn't take the risk to lose all the money, then you prefer to, for example, take the safer bet like this one to take a take a B for example instead of an A. If you're if you're risk averse, so that's why the utilities change. Uh, the one will have high utility than for for some of you than for others. Um, but um, but there's there's more to it than this. I think we don't have time to go to this example. There's a paradox here because sometimes they have the same uh, expected. Some of these I I forgot which one has the same expected value, but people prefer not to follow the expected value. So it's interesting. Uh, okay, let, let's continue. Um, Quickly, not this, sorry. Um, no, this one. Yeah, so. And I have some more, uh, some, I have some more quiz questions for you, but let's see if we get through, uh, otherwise we can do it next time. Um, okay, so, so most people prefer this, prefer B over A and C over D. Right, yeah, I, and most people prefer that, but um, but if you do end up calculating the utilities, uh, then basically what we get is that the utility of so B uh, B is preferred over A means that the utility of three K is preferred than the utility of four K times zero point eight, and C over D is this, uh, but C over D means that the utility of yeah basically the math comes out as completely flipped if you prefer b over a then it means uh you get you get a complete paradox with c if you prefer c over d in that case because p over d has the utility completely flipped you see 0 0.8 times the utility of 4k is higher than the utility of 3k but if you prefer b over a then you get the other way around you get the utility of 3k is higher than the utility of 4k times 0 0.8 so um yet people still prefer b over a and c over d even though the utilities don't work out. Yeah. Yeah. Because B is guaranteed, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Because he kind of get money here anyway, even though with the, well, roughly, or don't, or don't get, or more like you don't get. You kind of, it's most like, yeah. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Any other ideas? Any, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other ideas? Or any other explanations? Yeah. Worst case outcomes first, and then if those are uh-huh. the same, it's comparing the like the yeah, 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 yeah
Oh no, reinforcement learning is one part of it. It's like, it's much more in AI than just reinforcement learning, like uh, computer vision, uh, national language processing, all of these are using um, non-reinforcement learning uh, techniques, like supervised learning or unsupervised learning. These are, these are the paradigms that are being used for, yeah, for those uh, things. So, um, so you'll, you'll, you'll cover those if you, if you, if you take a course in, uh, in machine learning, you'll do like supervised learning, unsupervised learning. Um, it's, it won't cover too much in, in, in this intro to AI class, but uh, I'm happy to tell you about them, uh, about all of those as well. And uh, um, yeah, and those are different paradigms. So reinforcement learning is different. It's, it's basically where we have an, an environment and we have an agent operating in the environment, in that environment. Um, yeah, so, and we have, and the agent must uh, maximize the rewards. So the, you know, those rewards can be like for, yeah, for the game of Pac-Man is collecting those food items and getting to the goal state and maximize the score. So all of those are the rewards. Um, so, um, so these are some examples like balancing a pole, um, skills like cooking, taking classes and so on, playing music, scavenger hunts. Um, are we going to get goals and rewards and so on? Um, so, and this is a particular toy environment that we're talking about, we'll, we'll be using in our class. So, so this is a, like, uh, it's a grid world. We have a little robot that basically starts here in this like maze, uh, it starts at, at state one, one, and it can take uh, four actions. It can either go north, south, east, or west. So these are the possible, the, the, the set of potential actions that our little robot can take. This wall, so basically, it, can, it cannot go through this wall. So, like, uh, it has to always go, go to the yeah, uh, to stay in that environment. Um, yeah, and and there's like some small rewards at each step, which could be negative. Also, like, it could be like, uh, for example, that um, uh, it could be a negative reward at each step, uh, meaning that like you know the the the, the longer path you, the longer it takes you to find the goal state, which is plus one, uh, or or minus one, one of these the the worse it is so you have to find them as soon as possible for example so um and of course we want to reach the plus one state because the minus one will give us a, a bad reward so we really want to avoid minus one and reach a plus one state because uh, we are trying to maximize the sum of the rewards so yeah um so we, this is this, this is like a setting uh, in which our little robot lives um the another thing is that actions are stochastic that's another important concept so so, uh, for example, like uh, even if the if the robot tries to go north, uh, it will actually end up north eighty percent of the time. It would actually end up in the, in the north square. Sometimes ten percent of the time it will it will go east. Ten percent of the time it will go west. For example, so it will it will be because of let's say some errors in the robot, like maybe or it it, it slips on on the surface. It can slip. That can happen. So this slipping. So even though it it tries to go north, it will only end up north eighty percent of the time. Um, and the same, same for east, west, and so on. So this is this is the transition function, what we call like basically. Uh, even though it tries to go north, it will only end up with a particular probability there. Um, so that's our that's our setting, and um, and we can build a, a tree like before. We can build a tree like uh, where um, initially, if, if we have a starting state, so the robot is here. And you know, the deterministic law, fully deterministic, if it goes north, it actually ends up north. But now since, we, since we're in a stochastic wor uh, world, if it tries to go north, so this is the action it takes, it tries to go north, then you end up in a chance node. And this, this node with chance will have like three outcomes, can, can, either, can either actually go north or end up going east or west, flip, sorry, west or east. So, um, this is how we represent it with the, with the, with the tree structure, like before. Um, you've seen this. Um, and we, we define a few more things so to, to be able to fully to formally define what we, we call a mark of decision process. We have to define a few more things. We have to define a set of states uh, the robots can be in. So the, these are all the states, one, 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 two, one, three, uh, three, one, three, two, and so on. The set of actions we can take, north, south, east, west, what we call a transition function, T, um, and this T, the transition function can basically, what it means is that it's a probability that if you start in state S and take action A, you will end up in state S prime, 
what's the, what's the probability that you end up in S prime if you start in state S and take action A? And let's call also like the model. Um, we have a reward function, which means um, what is the reward you get uh, if you reach state S prime by starting in state S and taking action A? That's the reward uh, that you get. And of course, we have a start state, which is here, and a, and a terminal state, which would be ideally this one, but you can also end up in that one, uh, in the minus one. Yeah. Um, and this is basically, uh, yeah, and, and, and this is what we need generally to do reinforcement learning with what we call mark of the two hidden properties. Um, So, so again, so, so, so we have an interaction loop. So the environment, so we start in state S0, we choose an action. Then basically we transition to another state S prime according to the transition probability. Why did it look like that? So this T, then we receive a reward R. And then we take a new action, take another action at A1 now, we transition to a, another state S double prime, we receive another reward and so on. And we'll keep looping this, uh, looking like this. Yeah. And we see very, it will get super interesting next time in the next lecture, how we actually end up solving uh, formally with the, for, 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 these, uh, for these actions and basically find the optimal path for the maze. Cause, because the whole goal is how, how to, to find, how do we get, find a path to take us to the optimal goal in this, with this form of formalization. That'll be what we're trying to do. And this is, this is actually used in robotics. So how people do robotics research, they have to find, plan their path um, again, it's, it's really fascinating research. It's like, yeah, it's, it's something like that is actually used in practice nowadays. And, uh, yeah. And we, and we, we of course we're starting on a toy, on toy example, but this is the same algorithms work on a much more complex settings. Um, so I'll take any questions, any questions so far. Okay, uh, then I'll, let's stop here and we'll continue the next time. Um, I don't know. Uh, should I have? I don't think we. I don't think we need to be honest. Like I, I think if you do the worksheets, that should be enough. Yeah, yeah. The wor worksheets and the yeah and the, and the program assignments, of course. Yeah. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I know you said we're not supposed to like uh, change the code, right? But are we able to change the headers like in for like stacks and cute brutality and stuff like that? Ah, uh, you can use, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use uh, anything that is in the uh, standard Python so, like, library. So, so I can't really import from the utility section. I think there was something written in the assignment on that, on what you are allowed to do. I think the standard library you're allowed, but not like a- Not pack the one that's already written for us in pack AI. The, the one that has been given to you? Yeah, what it was given to us, but it wasn't important. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you can use that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because it wasn't there by default. So I want to make sure. That uh, I think so. I think I, 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 I will double check actually on that with, the, with Brian and, and the TAs. Um,